Love y'all. I appreciate what God is doing. So then the question would be, well, what's he doing? Well, I'm doing a lot of stuff. Be specific. He's changing and transforming. I don't know about y'all, but me. My dad used to say this all the time. When people, people, if we say this side and this side, if there's an issue, God's never working with just this side. He's working with both. Isn't that cool? So God is always working because he's working in us, to us, and through us to change us that we would be, oh yeah, unified. There it is. And unfortunately, we live in the microwave, text it, tweet it, whatever it, whatever we want it, instant. And God has been teaching a people, as long as I can remember reading the Bible, patience. I mean, I see a lot of times where we read things and we think it was instant, but then if we really start to ponder on it, was it really instant? Did it happen? I mean, even in the fact of healing, if you look at healing and some of the miracles that Jesus said, if you really break those words down, it says to cure. Well, curing takes a process, a time. So... All right, I'm going to get moving to where I, I had a witness in my spirit, I guess, if I can say it like that, of what, I got some notes here that I've had, geez, I don't know how long. And... It seems like I get up here, got to move a certain way, and it's like yeah. it never gets out what was out. But today there was a witness of what I was reading and what I've been looking at, you know, geez, for months. Does anybody know what we're talking about? What was that? And my mom jokes with me all the time, how are they going to get out of the fire? God hope not. I, I hope not. Because the fire didn't burn, it didn't bother him. And remember, I think I said it, uh, I don't know, however long ago it was. Our problem is we think fire is negative. Right? If you want to get on the positive negative thing, here we go. God's fire is not negative. It might be detrimental to some of the situations in your life, but in the end, you're going to be a happy camper. Because God's going to burn up everything in your life that he doesn't need. And guess what? Then when he puts a bunch of wood together, humanity together, he's going to have a bonfire. To purify. So he can have what he's going to have. Okay? So... We've been reading about in Daniel chapter 3, the three buds are in the fire. The reason why they got in the fire, why did they get in the fire? Because there's what is called the accuser of the brethren. Right? The accuser of the brethren got them in the fire. But we can even go back further than that. It was called unbelief of a whole nation or of the church. That got them down to this point where they're in the fire. Okay? But these three buds, they were united. The song. They had their eyes wide open. They seen what was coming. 
And they said, look, I, I said to Sandra yesterday, I said, or maybe it was this morning, I said, we sing this song all the time. We love to sing the song, right? God, even if you don't do it. But we really don't believe that. Because we really believe he's going to do it and bail us out of it. But the question was, really, or the circumstance was to them, they really believed that even if God didn't, they weren't bowing down. Okay? So here we go. Let's turn to... I'm going to read a lot today. I'm going to kind of... I'm going to try to be quiet so I can try to get through this. All right, here we go. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43. I want to do this as a precursor, I guess, or a launching pad. Can I say it like that? Okay. I'm going to read out an amplified classic. All right, Isaiah 41 or 43 verse 1. But now, in spite of past judgments for Israel's sins, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, here we go, listen up now. You've got to listen to what God is saying here. And he who formed you, O Israel. Just throw it in here. There's a difference between Jacob and Israel. Okay? What's the next word say? Fear not. Because why? Ransom you by paying a price instead of leaving you captives. My God, did he not do that to every single one of us that have received him? And the truth of the matter is, even those that haven't received him, he is reconciled and bought all of humanity back. I have called you by your name. Right? He's called you by his name. And what else did he do? He gave you his name in the waters of baptism. Right? You are mine. Here we go. And when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned or scorched, nor will the flames kindle upon you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt the, to the Babylonians for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba, a providence of Ethiopia in exchange for your release. Because you are precious in my sight. Keep telling you, it was God that picked you. You didn't pick him. You just agreed to what God has already been saying and declaring. Okay? Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and because I love you, I will give men in return for you and people in exchange for your life. Fear not. That's twice now he's told you not to fear. Yeah. For I am with you. Well, he either is... Or he isn't. I know I'm getting a little sidetracked here. Here we go. The Bible says that he said that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So you tell me when you're ever alone without God. But how much we worry, fret, dismay, whatever, because we think we're all alone. And God's always there. I mean, even the psalmist David said, God, even if I be a dirt bag and live a rotten life, once you've come to me, I can't get away from you, even in the fire. All right, here we go. All right. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east. Listen up. Here's a, see this. Here we go. Here's generational. Gonna bring your offspring from the east, where they are dispersed, and, and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Okay, even 
Even everyone who is called by, 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 even everyone who is called by my name. That's key. Whom I've created for my glory, who I'm formed, who I have made. Bring forth the blind people, right? Look, before you came to God, were you not blind? You had eyes. But you didn't see. Oh, yeah, you had, oh, yeah, and the deaf people, right? Who have ears. All right. Let all the nations be gathered together and let all the peoples be assembled. God's all into the assembly. All right? Who among the uh, uh, idolaters uh, could predict this? That Cyrus, you know, and then he goes on to say that Cyrus would deliver Israel. Well, you know that Cyrus just type and shadow. And to show us the former things, let them bring, uh, let them bring their, their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and acknowledge it is true. You are my witnesses. Who? Who's he talking to? He's talking to you. You are my witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and acknowledge it is the truth. You are my wit oh, I'm sorry. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, my servant, who I have what? That you may know me, believe me, and remain steadfast to me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I even I, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there's what? There's no good ideas. I have declared the future and have saved the nations in times of danger. I have shown that I am God. Um, when there was no strange or alien God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, I am God. All right? Let's see here. Yes, from the time of the first existence of the day and from this day forth, I am he, that there is no one who can deliver, no one that can do what? Where? out of his hands. And a lot of times we'll be like, God, why are we here? What are we doing? How did I get in this place? Trust me, you're in God's hands. He knows what he's doing. All right? I will work, and who can kinder or hinder or reverse it? I like that. Because God began the work, He's going to do what? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. See, he, re he keeps telling you who he is. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent one to Babylon, and I will bring down all of them as fugitives with all their nobles, even the, even the Chaldeans, into the ships over which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. He's telling you who he is. Thus says the Lord who made a way through the sea and, and, and a path through the mighty waters, who bring forth chariots and horses, armies and mighty warriors. They lay down together. They cannot rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a lamp wick. Do not earnestly remember the former things. Disclaimer. In the waters of baptism, what happens? What? What? All right. So when he says, don't remember the former things, it doesn't mean, look, I fell down over there because I didn't pick up the rake in the yard and I tripped over it. He didn't say, don't remember that. What he's telling you is not to remember is the Adamic way. And that's what he's telling you not to remember. Brother Bud taught us well. Wisdom is learned by making mistakes through this path of life and not repeating them. Wisdom. But the wisdom of God will allow you by the Spirit to reckon the new man alive and you got your foot on Satan's neck or Adam. Okay. Sorry. Here we go. 
Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a what? I don't see it and I don't feel it. Does that change it? I don't see it and I don't feel it. So is he or is he not? Behold, I am doing a new thing. Isn't it cool that Amplified's got an exclamation point? Who's the English grammar people in here? Oh, the three Hebrew children. Right? What does it mean? When, it, when there's an exclamation point, what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Do not remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do, not, do you not perceive and know it, and will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We love to quote those scriptures out of Isaiah. But you live in the wilderness. It's called the United States of America. It could be Canada. could be Mexico. could be whatever nation you live in. Your everyday life is a wilderness. And God has put his life in you that rivers will spring up in the desert and it will be a glorious place. That's pretty cool. All right. And guess what you get to do? The beasts of the fields will honor me, the jackals, the ostriches, because you'll give them water to drink, right, in a wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to people, his people, my chosen, all right, the people I formed for myself, that I may set forth my praise, and they shall what? I love the Amplified Classic, and it says, and they shall do it. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do it. Okay, here we go. All right, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. All right, this has to do with my portion that I shared with you all back with God's provision. God is providing his people. You just read all that in Isaiah prophesied to the people. God is providing. He is doing a new thing. Stephen came up here and started out the, the service says, His mercies are new. So God is doing a new thing every day in your life. You put yesterday behind you because you can't change it. And today is the day of salvation. Okay? Here we go. Philippians 4, out of the Amplified Classic. This is Paul, right? Now that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content. All right? Now, you know Brother Tim is the family man. Mom thinks I talk forked tongue over the family man. But you know what? Here's the family man. You know what the family man does? Family man takes care of the family. Family man sometimes has issues with the family. Does not God have issues with us? Okay. But this word content is a pretty cool word. Right? Paul says to be content is to be self-sufficient. Oh, I love being self-sufficient. Me, myself, and I. No, that's not what he's talking about. Self-sufficient means that he takes his responsibility of the new creation man, right? And he runs after God or has the tenacity of a weed and he just keeps coming. No matter what knocks him down, rolls him over, or whatever, he just keeps pressing on. Self-sufficiency. Remember the cross, right? Individual first, then corporate. 
A lot of times we come in the corporate setting and we want the corporate setting to lift us up, to pick us up, to build us up, to push us up, to do it for us, where that's not what he's saying. Paul is saying that you take your personal responsibility with your individual life with Christ, then you build that up, you come together, you gather together, and it's this constant pushing up and upward into him as the family. That's pretty good. I can't save you, and you can't save me, but I need what God has deposited in you, and you need what God has deposited in me. And if you look at the miracle to the right or to the left of you, you need every aspect of their life in you, and they need it in you. But it is each and every one of you's personal responsibility to take it upon yourself to press on towards the high calling of Christ. Here we go. To be content, self-sufficient, satisfied to the point. Here we go. Oh my God! I come into church, all grumbling and mumbling and table, kicking the dirt like like uh, what was uh, Billy um, Martin? Kicking the dirt, kicking the dust up in the air, living like the dirt bag, right? Because I'm not what? Satisfied to the point. No, 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 that's not what Paul said. Paul said that he's content and he's satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted in any or whatever state I find myself to be in. <gasps> Them three Hebrew children, what do you think? Because you were wondering, how do I relate that to this? I, I hear it. And I know how to be a base, and to live humbly in straightened circumstances. Anybody know what that means? When things ain't going your way. Pretty simple. And I know also how to do what? Enjoy plenty and live in abundance when things are going my way. We all like that. And I have learned in any and all circumstances, here we go, the secret of facing every situation whether well-fed or going hungry, having the sufficiency and enough to spare or going without and being in want. I have, I love the way the Amplified says it as compared to the King James. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses the inner man or strength into me, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. All right. Let's jump down to... Oh, I wanted to read this. Here, let me read this. This is Vincent's word study. Y'all with me today? I love you. I hope this helps you. It's helped me. The word uh, content in Vincent's word study says self-sufficient. It's only here in the New Testament a stoic word expressing the favorite doctrine of a sect. That man should be sufficient to himself for all things, able by the power of his own will. Isn't it amazing? That's the thing that God lets you keep. His own will to resist the shock of circumstance. Paul is self-sufficient through the power of the... Here we go. New man. The new self. Not himself, but Christ in him. Okay? Let's go down to verse 19. Chapter 4, verse 19. We all love this one. And my God will liberally 
supply. Here's that word in view, fill. Remember, my mom, what did I tell you? She crammed it down my throat. It was imbued. Filled up. She filled it up. She took the vessel, the word of God, and she shoved it down my throat and made sure that this vessel was filled up. Okay? And my God will supply, liberally supply, fill to the full your every need according to his riches in glory. Isn't it amazing that he says, in Christ Jesus? It's getting tight. But it's right. Here we go. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever through the endless eternities of the eternities. Amen. So be it. That's pretty good. Here we go. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Oh, I'm doing good. I got lots of time. Y'all with me today? <coughs> Can you see me all right? Here we go. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Okay. At that time, Jesus began to say, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And I acknowledge openly and joyfully to your honor that you have hidden these things from the wise and clever from the wise and clever and learn and learn and revealed them to babies to the childish untaught and unskilled yes father i praise you that such was your gracious will and good pleasure all things have been entrusted and delivered to me by my father and no one fully here we go and no one fully knows and accurately understands the son except the father and no one fully knows and accurately understands the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son deliberately wills to make himself known. That's pretty good. Nobody, nobody, nobody comes unless the Father draws. Nobody. How did you get here? Did you come from intellectual knowledge of who he is to get to where you're at? Or did God take all that foolishness in your head and by his spirit do something in here to make something change up here that you said, I can't always understand it or explain it, but there's something in me that knows it. All right, here we go. Oh, where are them three Hebrew children at? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. Isn't it amazing how many songs we sing about the soul? No Christian songs. Seriously. The soul is constantly needing to be refreshed. Constantly. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, lowly in heart, and, and what? And you will find rest. So what did verse 28 say? It said, come to me. I already got Jesus. He's right here. You already said it. He never leaves you nor forsake you. You. Yep. But he said, come to me. All the time, Brother Bud. All the time. 
Here we go. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. Jeremiah 6, 16 says this. Thus says the Lord, stand by, stand by the roads and look. Stand by what? The roads, the pathways. There's lots of, there is a way that seems right, but the end thereof are the pathways. So here he says, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the eternal paths where the good old way is then walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, they said, we don't say, but they said, they ain't going to do it. But we say, where's Leah? Yes, Lord. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant, and my burden is light, in easy to be born, right, or to bore. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 7. Chapter 7, Romans. Oh, I want to read that out of the... The Passion Translation. All right, let's let's uh, let's see where do I want to go. Here we go. Let's start here. This is good. Verse fifteen. This makes me laugh. I'm a mystery to myself. For I want to do what is right, but end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. And if my behavior is not in line with my desire, my conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. And now I realize that I am no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. For now I know that nothing good lives within my flesh of my, of my fallen humanity. The longing to do what is right are within me, but willpower is not enough. Yeah. Positive thinking, nothing, not a throwing stone at you, Ron. Positive thinking is not going to get it done. Just is. You need something more powerful than even your will to accomplish it. Oh yeah, we have it. It's called the Holy Ghost. Do we always operate in the Holy Ghost? Unfortunately, I don't. Okay, here we go. My lofty desires are to do what is good are dashed when I do things I want to avoid. Here we go. Let's verse 20. So if my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, to do good I must conclude that I am not that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. Though my experience of this principle, I discover that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to do what? Sabotage me. Truly, here we go. Truly deep within my true identity, I love to do what pleases God. But I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against my moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner to the law of sin and death. This unwelcome intruder is called my, it says humanity, my naturalness, my trying to separate my spirit from my natural being, my vessel. You can't do it. 
if the theme scripture out on the sign says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, what is he? Well, you either are or you aren't. You can't have it both ways. You're either a spirit being or a human being. I get it. You can give the application, we're still human. But what prevails? That would be my question. Three Hebrew children, where are they right now? What do you think is prevailing? Their humanism? Or the deposit of God within? Oh, Brother Tim, but you, you're, you're saying we have the Holy Ghost, New Testament, and them were Old Testament figures, but there was, oh yeah, Christ. He always was. I know, I know. Here we go. Where did I leave off? What verse? Oh, yeah. What an agonizing situation I'm in. Exclamation point. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? It's a question. Here we go. I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power who is what? Finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So it is left to myself that flesh is aligned with the law of sin and death, but now my renewed mind, here we go, your what mind? And how did you get a renewed mind? You don't sound very uh, convinced that you have a renewed mind. We spend too much time in the world and not enough time in the Word being washed over and cleansed so when we are in the world that now it becomes His world and not our world. Okay? All right. I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. So I am left to myself. The flesh is aligned with the law of sin and, sin and death. But now my renewed mind is fixed on the submission to God's righteous principle. You go to the next chapter, verse 8. It says, there is therefore now no what? Condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What does that say? That says that if along this path that we journey, you have slips, trips, and falls, don't condemn yourself. Right? What would you say? How many times? Seven. Seven. Well, we know where the perfect fall was at. It was over there. Okay. Here we go. Galatians chapter 5. This all make sense yet? All right. Galatians chapter 5. Let me be clear. The anointed one, right, Christ, has set us free. Not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back in the bondage of Adam's ways. That can be his thinking, his doing, his whatever. Okay? Amplified says this, In this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held, here we go, ensnared and submit again to the yoke of slavery which you have once Put off. Where did that happen? 
over there. Okay? Let's see here. Here we go. Got lots of time. Hebrews chapter 4. Y'all with me? Amplified classic. This is what it all boils down to. You ready? Therefore, while the promise of entering into rest still holds and is offered today. When's it offered? That's why his mercies are new every day. He gives you opportunity every day to enter in. Okay? Let us be, all right, let us be afraid to distrust it. All right? Let us be afraid to distrust it. To distrust what? That while the promise of entering into his rest still holds and is offered today. Believe it. Lest any of you should think, of, uh, think he has to come or has come too late and has come short of reaching it. There's always opportunity. Don't you love it? Aren't you glad God gave us opportunity? For indeed we have had the glad tidings, right? We've had the glad tidings, the gospel of God, proclaimed to us just as truly as what? The Israelites of old did when the good news, the gospel, was delivered of deliverance and bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with what? Faith. With the leaning of the entire personality of God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness by those who heard it. Today, if you hear his voice, right? Neither were they, here we go, neither were they united in faith with the ones Joshua and Caleb who heard did believe. For we who have believed and adhered to and trusted in and, rel and relied on God, do enter into his rest in accordance with the declaration of those who did not believe, should not enter in when he said, as I swore thy wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And this he said, although his works had been completed and prepared and waiting for all who would believe, that would be us, from the foundations of the world. For in a certain place he said about this, right? About the seventh day. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And they forfeited their part in it for this. In this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Seeing what? Seeing then that the promise remains over from past times for some to enter the rest. That's pretty good. That ought to make you excited. And that those who formerly were given the good news about it and the opportunity failed to appropriate it and did not enter in because of what? It says disobedience. But unbelief is the same thing. Because unbelief produces disobedience, which produces fear, which produces, oh yeah, lots of other things. And again, he set a definite day. Everybody want to know what the day is? Here we go. Listen up. I'm going to tell you. And again, he sets a definite day. A new, because he's doing a new thing, and that day is called today. And he gives another opportunity of securing that rest, saying through David, after so long a time, in the words already quoted today, if you would hear my voice. Right? And when you hear it, do what? Do what it says. Don't harden your heart. All right? This is what he said in the Psalms. For he is our God, and we are his people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in Meribah and Massa, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. All right, that comes out of, out of what? 
that comes out of the Psalms. Anybody know what those words mean? Everybody know what that is, right? The bitter waters? Let me, let me read this. I like this. I like this. This is, this, was out of the, this is out of Strong's. Meribah. This is the word Meribah. Meribah. Meribah means strife or contention. And it comes from another root word that means strife and contention. And it also means to quarrel, provocation, strife. And it comes from another word. The root word means to strive or to contend. Here's another one. Properly to toss. That is to grapple most figuratively to wrangle. That is to hold controversy. Yeah. Here is my thought. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4 that the work of the ministry, right, is all for the what? Completing of the saints that they would no longer be the word is children, but it means it's, it's uh, I believe that one, it's nephios, meaning infants. That we would no longer be infants doing what? Toss to and fro by every thought that comes through my mind. See, it says doctrine, but it's the same thing. It's every thought that we think or doesn't align up with God's word. Yeah. See, that was what my dad used to preach here all the time. He always preached this. If it doesn't line up with the word, you need to check it out. Because the rest of it just becomes every wind of doctrine. And you become a child tossed to and fro running from here to there, this to that, and whatever else, to try to do the work of the ministry. And all God has ever asked you to do is do what he asked you to do. Well, what is that? Obey his word. What else did he ask you to do? It's quiet. Okay, here we go. This, all right, verse number eight, Hebrews chapter four. You're not getting tired on me, it's one o'clock. All right? This message of the rest was not, was not a reference to their ending into Canaan. Right? He, the promised land was not Canaan. What was the promised land? Anybody know? It's called Christ. Christ is the promised land. God is the promised land. Canaan was not the promised land. That's why he said, there's a day of rest that he offers to you. And that rest is only found in Christ. And today is the day to enter in. Okay, here we go. For if Joshua had given them rest, he's explaining it, if Joshua had given him rest, he, God, would not have speak afterwards of another day. So then, they're still awaiting a full and complete Sabbath rest reserved for true people of God. The true Jew worships in spirit and in truth. What is God doing in, our, in the people? In us, in me. He is working his spirit in truth in and through me to cleanse the man. So God can have his original purpose in intent was to do what? To walk in a man. Well, how can he walk in a man if one thinks this away, one thinks that away, one's doing it this away? One's doing it that way. He can't. 
But there is a people. There is a true Israel of God. Oh yeah, it's the wheel in the wheel, fire in the fire, church in the church. Okay, here we go. Verse 10. For he who once entered, God's rest also has ceased from what? Back to what he said over there in what? Matthew. The weariness and pains of human labors. Just as God rested from those labors, peculiarly his own. All right? Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, for ourselves, individually, corporately, that no one may fall or perish by, by the same kind of what? Unbelief and disobedience in which those in the wilderness fell. Verse 12, for the word of God speak, right? For the word of God speaks is alive, is full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit and the joints and the marrows of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing, sifting, analyzing, judging the very thoughts, purposes of the heart. And not a creature, you're not hiding from God, is what the next verse says. You ain't fooling anybody. Guess what? The president's going to let us all take our mask off, but God really knows if we keep it on. All right. Look, I wear a mask sometimes. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest, I don't want to read any more of that, okay? We good there? Ah, let's see. Let's go to... I had another verse I wanted to read, but I won't read it. Go home and read 1 Peter 3 and 4. No, I do want to read that. I do want to read it. Because this has to go with what Brother Bud said on Thursday. See, y'all don't think I listen to what other people say. I do listen to what other people say. Okay? 1 Peter 3 and 4. But let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the, it says, hidden person of the heart, or the hidden man of the heart, with the incorruptibility and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is not anxious or wrought up, but is very precious in the sight of God. Amen. The hidden man of the heart. The hidden man of the heart. I pray all the time, God strengthen the people in the inner man. Paul declared, the inner man is the real man. It's who you really are. Even though this, and this is what you said, this outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed in strength by the Spirit. That's why the Bible can say, well, even if you have to take a nap, I'll still be there. Because guess what? Oh yeah, I'm not the God of the dead, but I'm the God of the living. God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and he goes on and on and on. And you get down in the Hebrews chapter 11, there were those that gave up salvation for a better resurrection. That's pretty good. All right. Here we go. I got one last thing. Oh, actually, I got more than that. We'll see. Hebrews chapter 3. I just want to bring this together. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, beware, brethren. Take care lest any one of you, right, lest there be any 
in any one of you, lest there be in any one of you, a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuse to cleave to, trust in, and rely on him, leading you to turn away and desert or stand aloof from the living God. Remember in the book of Revelation where he talked to the church of Ephesus? What did they do? They left their what? They didn't lose their first love. They walked away from it. That's exactly what he's saying here. And he says, don't let any of you be fooled. Don't be, don't be fooled. Every one of us could find ourselves in this place. They found, look, they had the gospels to them. And what did they all do? They died in the wilderness because of unbelief. We don't want to die in the wilderness because of unbelief. We want to be in the kingdom because we believe. Okay, here we go. But instead, instead warn, Imani, warn here, I, this is what I'm doing today. Right? Because we have a little story in the book of Daniel about three little guys, right? Three Hebrew children that would not budge by their circumstances and God was able to deliver them in the midst of the fire. So I'm warning. I'm warning myself. This is for me. But instead, warn and admonish, ur urge and encourage one another every day as long as it is called. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? That none of you may be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin. It is it's fun for a moment. And that's not all of what most people think it is. You know what sin really is? You just forfeit the prize. How many sports people are in here? Here's a team. Here's a team. This team doesn't show up to the game. This team shows up. Guess what these people did over here, this team? They forfeited the prize. What happens to this team over here? They automatically win. They didn't even have to do anything. Okay, here we go. By the fraudulent and, and uh, strag 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 the trickery which is delusion or delusive glamour of a sin may play on him. Where are we led away by? We ain't led away because somebody else has done it. We're led away by what? Our own desires. Don't let your desires deceive you. That's why the Bible says God will give you, remember, oh, we all love this. God will give you the desires of your heart. No, he won't. He'll give you the desires of his heart. That's what Pastor James said down in the book of James. He said, be careful what you ask for. And he says, oh, yeah, you don't get because you don't ask because you ask amiss. You're, asking for the, you're praying for the wrong desires. But when you pray for the right desires, which are his desires, he always gives you his desires. That's pretty good. All right. All right, verse number 14. For we, for we have become fellows with Christ the Messiah and share in all, all that he has, right, for us. If only, here we go. If only we hold our first newborn confidence and original assurance, expectation, in virtue of which we are believers, firm and unshakable to the end. Right? He that endures to the end shall be saved. All right? There's one last thing I want to read out of Galatians. Go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. We good? All right, Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, the Messiah, lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith 
by adherence to the reliance on the complete trust in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Therefore, I do not treat God's gracious gift as something of minor importance and defeat its very purpose. What is God's purpose? That you would be just like him. Is that not it? We are created in his likeness and his image. His purpose is, he, hey, he called you gods. That's pretty cool. He wants you to be just like him. Jesus will always have the preeminence, but he was the firstborn among many brethren. And when the brethren dwell in unity, it pleases the Father. Okay, here we go. I do not set, uh, set aside or invalidate and frustrate and nullify the grace, the unmerited favor of God. For if justification, righteousness, acquittal from guilt comes through observing rituals or just come in the church, the law, then Christ the Messiah died groundlessly and to no purpose in vain. His death was wholly superfluous. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Brother, what are you trying to say today? I'm trying to say a lot. I'm trying to say just because it doesn't look like it sometimes, just because it doesn't sound like it sometimes, just because it doesn't feel like it sometimes, God's working. God's working behind the scenes. And if you allow God, if I allow God, if we allow God in his fullness to work in our lives, we'll see a, a transformation in the lives of not only ourselves, but here. You want to get it out of, out of the four walls of the church? All right, I'm going to tell you. It's been getting out of the four, the, the four walls of the church for as long as this church has been here because each and every one of you go to your families, go to your workplace, go to wherever you shop, go to wherever you are, and whether you express who he is in you is up to you, not up to me. That's a good thing. That's what God did. Because guess what? I can't go to where you're at, but he can go to where every single one of us are at and express who he is through you. What a witness. What a witness. What a glorious witness that God has that he put it himself in a people so it could spread his glory. How do you think his glory is going to fill all the earth? It's going to be through you. Amen? On your feet. So what we want to do, we want to keep Sam and Megan in prayer. They're, they're getting married on Friday. I'm going to be there, right? 